Welcome to the 16th edition of Gather, ASU Care's monthly storytelling series, always held on the final Wednesday of every month. My name is Kyle Mitchell, and I'll be your host today. I am Dene, so in Dene culture, we introduce ourselves. Yate, Shea, Kyle Mitchell, Yenshia, Tore Chitni Nishle, Nakai Basichin, Kayani Deshiche, Nakai Deshnele, Kiltui Bitua, Ado Chesna Dozi Dena Shah. Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle Mitchell. I am uh, here with you and your host. I am an adjunct uh, faculty member at South Mountain Community College with our Storytelling Institute. Uh, I'm a veteran, served in the military, uh, in the Army. Um, now, I'm an educator, uh, work at South Mountain Community College as a program manager for our extended campuses as well as our workforce initiatives. So thank you for being here tonight. Uh, tonight we are broadcasting live from the wonderful historical ASU CARE and, a, and we have a great set of storytellers this month that will share their personal It's a Tradition stories, Kathy Nakagawa and Carly Davis. After we share our stories, we'll end the show with a conversation and a Q&A featuring your questions. Please send your questions in the chat anytime during the show. We love hearing from you. So whenever you have a chance, type in a few questions and we'll get to those. Uh, we encourage you to support our storytellers with your positive heart, with your positive thoughts, hearts, applause, and more in the chat. Tonight, I'll be setting the tone for the evening by sharing a traditional story before we go into our personal stories. And so when we think about storytelling, we think about traditional tellings, right? They're all oral traditions. And over time, they change. They're passed from one generation to the next. And when they transition, they use whatever's in context within the culture at that time, right? So they use the verbiage. They add more characteristics, become more charismatic with that. So the story I'm going to share with you is a story about the emergent story of the Diné, of the Navajo. So long, long ago, we were in the fourth world. And in this fourth world, all of the animals could talk. They can sing, they could dance, they could do all of these different things. And they lived side by side with all of the people. And there was one mischievous person, right? If you think really hard, we all know one mischievous person. This person was Ma'i, the coyote, right? The one who's always stirring his hand in the pot here, there, doing what tricksters do, right? I think you can think of one. If you can't think of one, it might be you. Just saying. So in this fourth world, everything lived in harmony. People, animals, the elements, everything was fine. One day, Ma'i was walking around. He picked up a rock, and he threw that rock across the water. And it skipped, skip, skip, skip. And then it stopped and went straight down. And Ma'i looked around, and he got another rock, and he threw it. He threw the rock, and the rock came flying back towards him. Barely missed his head threw another rock and oh, flew past him again. And the thing that was throwing the water back was the water monster who lived in the bottom of the water. So Ma'i would start walking closer and walking closer to the edge of the water and then the water started parting, right? Making a pathway, slowly moving, the waves gushing side by side. And there in the middle, he saw a door. Ma'i looked down at this door and the door opened. And it just looked like running water. A figure made of running water made his way to the edge. And he got there and he looked at Ma'i. Ma'i looked at him and he kind of poked around. Hmm, who are you? I've never seen you before. Why, do you, why are you wearing water? That's cool. Can I touch it? He reached out to touch it. Guy's hand smacked away. And then he backed up a little bit. And then Ma'i said, well, that's really nice. That's a really nice coat. How about we play a, a small game and if I win, I get to keep your coat. And if you win, you keep the coat. The water monster said, okay, that sounds, that sounds good to me. So water monster went, uh, sat down, th took his cloak off, put it over a little rock, and started playing with Ma'i. They started playing back and forth, and Ma'i, being the trickster he is, he just started making up rules, right? Uh, two plus five equals 26, right? Just started throwing random things out there, throwing the water monster off. And finally, the water monster said, okay, let's see who's going to win. So they started playing, flipping rocks left and right, back and forth, back and forth. And Ma'i leaned over and he told water monster, pay attention to this. I want you to pay attention to this game with all of your focus, all your intention here. He said, okay, okay, I'm doing that. And while he was doing that, Ma'i started sidestepping, right? Moving a little over, moving a little over, moving a little over. And he reached over the water cloak, 
and he reached over it, and he dug his hands underneath, and he felt something that was kind of squishy, right? It moved around just a little bit, but then he noticed Water Monster was getting frustrated and started moving around and was about to look around, and Mutt, he reached in, he grabbed that, and he put it in his, in his fur. And then Water Monster said, okay, yes, I'm done. And Mutt, he said, oh my gosh, you won the game. Congratulations, you get to keep your cloak. So he put his cloak back on, he went back down. And after a short amount of time, uh, Mutt, he reached into his fur, pulled out a little baby. It was a Water Monster baby. And then once he started rubbing it, water started coming out. And he's like, oh, this is cool. I like this. I like this. I'm not going to tell anybody, right? When you find that one random toy or that one random snack, right, you don't want to share it with it, but you just kind of keep it hidden. So he did that, kept it hidden. Meanwhile, the water monster got home, took his cloak off, and went to go reach in to pull out his two babies. Instead, he pulled out just one. Reached in the other one, couldn't find anything. Reached in a little bit more, couldn't find anything. And he started looking around, oh my gosh. Started flipping over the table, looking underneath the bed, underneath the couch, everywhere. He couldn't find anything. So he got furious, he got upset, and he says, you know what, the only time I took my cloak off was with that little trickster up there, Mutty. And then so what he did is he got mad, he started moving around side by side, and as he's moving around side by side, the waves start crashing back and forth and back and forth, roaring, slapping the side of the mountain. Just then, that's when the people started getting scared, started asking, what's happening, what's going on, what's going on? So they went to the only people they could talk to, which was first man and first woman. And they went over there and they told them the waves are getting crazy, we don't know what's going on, it just keeps, the tides keep getting higher and higher and higher. So then the waves started getting dangerously high and the people started gathering closer and closer together. Well, first woman had a pet. This pet was a little tiny bird when they first got to this fourth world. But over time, as there was different plants growing and there was different crops coming up, she would feed this little bird. Finally, this little bird grew up and grew up and it was about this big and it was round like a circle. It looked like a giant Butterball, right? And so this little Tudgy, it's called Tudgy, that's what we call turkey, he would eat all of these little seeds. And so first woman came in and she told him, we have to go, we have to get out of here, we gotta leave, the world is flooding, the water is rising. So then what Tudgy did is he went forward and then he leaned back or turned his head around, looked back and he saw the storage of where all the seeds were. He says, well, if we're going to someplace new, I still need to eat, right? I need a snack. We're going to have something we need to feed ourselves. So he went over, he grabbed one seed, lift up one of his feathers, and put it underneath, just like that. And so as he was going out the door again, he thought, nah, I can't just take one seed. Let me go back for another one. And then he couldn't stop there. And he went until every single feather on his body had one little seed tucked underneath it. And then he finally made his way out of the house. And just like I said, a little butterball making his way out with his little legs. And he starts moving, starts walking and getting out there. And then he sees first woman and first man waving at him, telling him to hurry, hurry and get here. Meanwhile, first man and first woman, first man and first woman were able to plant these giant reeds on the highest hilltop. And they sang the prayers and they sang these songs and they called to the deities the Nashnish, the wind that helped spur these different things and went up and up and up in the air. And as it went up in the air, people started climbing. The birds started flying. The animals started using their hands and their feet, making their way up. And then here comes Tudji, right? The turkey, making his way, moving back and forth, moving back and forth. And once he got there, he was so tired and his face was all red. He couldn't talk and he was like, oh, gobble, gobble, gobble. And he made his way. First woman grabbed him under his shoulder and made his way up and kept on going up and going up until they got to where we are today, the fifth world. And just then, the last individual to make it to the top was no one other than Ma'i. And Ma'i was there. First man went to him and said, what have you done? I know this is related to you and your doings. So what he did is Ma'i kind of bounced around. Yeah, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And then finally, Reluctantly, he reached into his fur and he pulled out the water monster baby. He pulled out the baby and he says, all right. He tickled it one more time and then he put it 
down into this giant hole. And it landed in the water, and just then the water stopped and slowly started receding. And so, as we started progressing life here in this fifth world, everything that we eat before you today, every seed that is planted, every crop that is picked is because of Taji. And I'm glad to see that even in a way, at least within American culture, at the end of November, we always celebrate a time when we gather all together and we give thanks for all the people we have, all the blessings in our life, all the good luck and good friends we have. But the one thing we need to remember and give thanks for is Taji right there in the middle. So as you go forward into your traditions throughout this year, look at it again and take a different perspective of where those stories come from and how those stories and um, traditions are interpreted by other groups out there. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. So I wanna welcome up our first teller, who is Carly Davis. So Carly is an educator, a storyteller, a matchbox racer, and a finger painter. She is currently an adjunct story, uh, storytelling faculty at the Storytelling Institute at South Mountain Community College. She is also a coach for the Storytellers Project, helping neighbors and notables uh, create stories for a nationwide series of live events curated by journalists from the USA Today. She has worked in the arts and culture uh, fundraising for 15 years. She is passionate about storytelling, shopping small businesses, raising boys, and succulents. Put your hands together and welcome Carly. Kyle, thank you so much. And thank you, ASU Care, for keeping storytelling going and for having us all here tonight. It's a tradition. As I've been thinking about our prompt for this evening's event, I've been thinking about traditions in my own family. We have a lot of them, after all, probably, when you start to try to hold them all together, probably some of the same ones you have. What's right around the corner except the start of the new school year? So what does that mean? That tradition is new shoes, taking a picture of my children before they head out on that first day of school with their backpack stuffed full and the big box of crayons. My kids are little, so that's still a really fun, exciting, happy day. Summer camp was another tradition. My boys are just getting old enough to be able to go to sleepaway camp. And my husband and I were so excited to be able to do that for them. Neither one of us got to do that as a child, but we were so looking forward to being able to send them. But I was also looking forward to bringing them back home. I knew they would come back a little older and wiser with new opinions and new fart jokes, because they're boys. And then the biggest traditions of all for us are all around Christmas. For the kids, it's all about the presents. But for us, it's about getting our family together, getting to watch our kids interact with all of our extended family. We are so fortunate. We have a lot of grandparents and family all around us. So much so that in years past, I cooked three times. There was one year that I prepared Christmas Eve, Christmas morning, and Christmas dinner. But it was worth it to get everybody together and celebrate. My personal favorite tradition is around Christmas Eve. We would always go to church that night, and I love sitting in the sanctuary all together looking out the stained glass windows, and it's cold and dark outside, but we're all together. And the very last thing always is they lower the lights, and then we all have one white candle, and we sing Silent Night. That's such a precious tradition for me. I always grew up with it, and I had been including that in my family life. But also, like for everyone else, COVID changed so many of our traditions. When I think about the past year, back to school wasn't really the same. They just went to the kitchen table 
They didn't go anywhere. And I didn't buy them any new shoes because I could hardly get them dressed anymore. I took their picture, but it's just the two of my two oldest boys are sitting at the kitchen table with headphones on, scowling at the school-issued tablets. Remember when we used to worry about screen time? What happened to that? And then summer camp was canceled, as it should have been, absolutely. That just for me was like the other shoe drop moment of early COVID where I realized this was big and real and happening and lasting. And I was going to have to figure out how to help my family deal with all these disappointments around our traditions that had to be postponed or canceled, but definitely changed. And then Christmas, <laughs> we, we still got to see um, our families, but in a different way. Um, we still got to go to church, but in a different way. Our church was really creative, and we were still able to gather. Um, but instead of the sanctuary, we were out on the playground. They had put hula hoops six feet apart, all in the wood chips. And so every family, we came with our extra blankets, and we sat on the ground on the hula hoop and listened to Christmas Eve service, and the choir still sang. They were all masked and six feet apart, all down the sidewalk. <laughs> but we still got to have Christmas Eve. And I cried. I was so glad just to be there. It felt so important to keep that tradition. And then I cooked. I think that might be one of my patterns. I, when I uh, feel my feelings, then I turn around and cook. So I wanted to still make a nice meal for that holiday. By that time, I had lost both of my jobs due to COVID. But I knew that I could make a 20-pound turkey last. I could make those leftovers stretch for over a week. So I sprang for the big bird, and I made all the sides that the kids actually eat, which really boils down to just the sweet potato casserole with the marshmallows on top. And we all ate together at the same kitchen table. And something else happened. I think because of all those years of me hosting, we were still central for everyone's plans. And so one by one, we start getting phone calls and messages that little units of our family are on their way. And we would get one of those calls. We would put on a mask and run outside to the driveway and have a Christmas moment with our family. And we got to watch the kids unwrap a few gifts and the tissue paper is blowing away down the street. But we still got to be in the presence energetically of our loved ones. And that felt like a really important tradition to still have. I remember one of those in particular was the last one, I think, of Christmas. My children's godfather let us know he was on his way. So we all run outside. And while we were outside, our pandemic rescue German shepherd climbed up on the kitchen counter and ate that whole bowl of leftover turkey. I had just deboned the bird, and I left the whole thing on the counter. A week's worth of dinners went into the dog. But we were together. I also think about some little traditions. They're probably really just habits, but they feel important enough to me to call them traditions that we kept in this past COVID year and a half. We kept bedtime, for starters. My kids are little, and I can't parent after about 9 o'clock. 
So we were keeping the bedtime routine going. We read tons of books, and then lights were off by about 9 o'clock. And every morning, my husband would make a pot of coffee to share with me and a cheese omelet to share with the kids. And those little, little everyday traditions helped carry us through this past year and a half. And I look forward to being able to bring back some of the big traditions as soon as it's safe. But in the meantime, I will keep those little traditions that all happened around my kitchen table. Thank you so much. Wow, such a great story, Carly. So what other traditions have you discovered lately? Oh, um, you know, I'm trying to start a few because I, I genuinely um, thought about this when I was preparing for tonight, and sometimes I feel like I don't have any or I don't have enough, and I'm trying to start one with my kids around the first monsoon of the year. Where the, you get through that summer, and that first rain is really special, so um, we go out to the Boyce Thompson Arboretum, and just everything smells amazing. And um, I have to come up with menu for that because, of course, we need a special food. But I'm trying to start a monsoon tradition with my family. Oh, beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank Another you, Another round Kyle. of applause for Carly. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So for our last story tonight, before we move to the Q&A, we have Kathy Nakagawa. Kathy is an associate professor of Asian Pacific American Studies in the ASU School of Social Transformation. Her research explores the inequity in education, including issues related to parent involvement, school reform, and racial literacy. She is also part of a research team working on the Asian American Pacific Islander uh, Women's Health Project, uh, which examines the the ways personal stories, culture, family, and immigration influence health choices. Here's Kathy. Thank you so much, Kyle, and thank you for having me here. Uh, You know, growing up, the big family holiday food tradition for us centered around New Year's. Um, A few days before New Year's, we'd go to my grandma's house for a mochi-making party, and the aunts would all gather, and they would make big pots of rice, and then the rice would get transferred to these wooden boxes that were covered with moist cheesecloth, and that was carried out and put over an open fire. The boxes were stacked, and all that rice was steamed until it could go into the mochi grinding kneading machine. So in Japan, when mochi is made, which is rice cakes, it's pounded until it's a paste. But here we had the wonderful technology to have a machine that could grind it up. So my dad put all the rice in there and it would grind it up like a big Play-Doh machine and it would extrude it out in this roll. And the extruded mochi would come out and we had a big wooden table outside and my aunts and the kids would gather on both sides of the table. The table was covered with plastic and then there was cornstarch and rice flour sprinkled over it. And we would all grab little bits of this mochi. It was still hot to the hands. We'd grab it and we'd make it into the little rice cakes and then we'd put it aside to dry. At one point, one of the aunts would say, special mochi coming, and we would all, the inexperienced mochi makers, would take a step back, and the experienced mochi makers would step forward, and they would be around the table. And the next batch of mochi would have to be made really special because they were the big ones, they had to be smooth on top because they were the ones that were placed on the altar as offerings for those who had passed before us. And they were also the ones that had the sweet beans put into them for later. So that was one part of our New Year's Day tradition. The next part was on New Year's Eve, we'd go back to my grandma's house, us and the whole extended family, and all the women would go into the kitchen and all the men would go into the living room. And the women would prepare the feast for New Year's Day. I remember feeling so proud when I was old enough to join the women in the kitchen to cook It wasn't until years later I realized there's some gender inequity here, but that was okay. I was still excited. We cooked teriyaki chicken and all kinds of sushi. Um, We cut up this really hard root called gobo and cooked it with carrots to make kimpira. 
we made these little mini octopus and small fish, and all of this food got prepared, and we were going to join together the next day on New Year's to join, eat it together. But our own immediate family's New Year's wasn't done yet. Our New Year's Eve, we'd leave Grandma's house. It was 10 or 11 at night, and we'd rush home for my mom's tradition, which was to get all of the trash out of the house before 11.59 at night. You could not start the New Year with any trash in the house. We'd go from room to room, the bathrooms, the bedrooms, the kitchen, the refrigerator, the garage. We'd get it all in a big trash bag and rush it out to the alley just in time before the New Year so we could start fresh. And then, sometimes my mom would make her special punch. She'd get out the big crystal punch bowl, and she'd put in 7-Up and Hawaiian punch concentrate with some rainbow sherbet. And we'd mix it all up, and she had the little glasses around the edge of the punch bowl on little hooks, and we'd get, each, we'd get our little glass to have our special punch. And then we'd go to bed. In the morning, we'd wake up to these wonderful smells, because for my mom, it wasn't just enough that we were going to share a New Year's Day feast with the extended family. She wanted the immediate family to have something together, too. And so she had gotten up early to start cooking. The most important part of our meal was ozoni, the soup that, that welcomed us to the new year. We couldn't eat anything else before we had our ozoni soup. So we'd get together around the table, and she brought out the lacquer bowls, which was the only time all year that we used these lacquer bowls. And they each had their own lid and we would sit down together and have the soup to start our new year. The only other rule she had for us for New Year's Day was we could not spend any money, because if we did, it meant that we would be overspending the whole year, and that's not a good thing to start the new year with. I left home, and I went to college, and I got married to a wonderful guy named Tim, and we had two incredible daughters named Willa and Thea, and I honestly didn't carry any of these traditions forward. And then one year, when my daughters were not too old, they were like, what family traditions do we have? I was like, especially around the holidays. And I said, we have all sorts of traditions. We do the neighborhood ghosting around Halloween, where we leave special treats anonymously on people's doorsteps. We help with the luminaries at the beginning of December. We make those every year. We go caroling with our neighbors. They're like, those aren't our traditions. Those are the neighborhood traditions. I was like, wait, 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 we do have other traditions. When you wake up on Christmas morning, if it's before 7 a.m., you cannot wake anybody else up, and you can only open your stocking. And you can't talk about your birthday until exactly a month before your birthday. No planning for the parties, no asking for any presents. And because we're not too religious, we don't celebrate Easter, so you can't ask for an Easter basket. They're like, those aren't really traditions. I said, I guess they're kind of like, anti-traditions when I started thinking about it. And that kind of made me feel bad. It happened that that year, around the holidays, um, Tim's family was coming to visit us from the East Coast. They were arriving the day after Christmas and leaving on New Year's Day. And so I thought, well, they're here. Maybe, maybe I should share some of my food traditions with them. And so I knew I had to make those only soup. Um, but I hadn't actually made it with my mom, and she had already passed away. And I was really sorry that I had never gotten the recipe from her. I did have a cookbook that she had handed down to me, and I looked up all those only recipes in there. And then I called my cousin, Glenn, in California, who was famous for having eaten like a dozen bowls of my grandma's ozoni soup on New Year's. I thought, if anyone knows the recipe, Glenn does. So I called Glenn, and I'm like, Glenn, I'm trying to make the soup. What's in it? Can you give me any hints? And he's like, you know, Kathy, um, it's Swanson's chicken broth. So I was like, oh, I can do this. I can do the Swanson's chicken broth. So I got the Swanson's chicken broth. You do add other things to it. It's not just that. You add some dashi, which is some um, fish stock, and then you add the other things. And the most important elements of the Sozoni soup are actually what goes in it that helps you to start the new year well. So there's chicken in there, and that represents and wishes you prosperity for the year. And there's spinach, which is green and gives you hopes for wealth. And there's some kamaboko, which is a fish cake that has a little bit of pink on the edge and some white, and it's supposed to be representative of the rising sun in Japan. And it wishes you fidelity for the year. And then, of course, you have your omochi, your rice cake in the soup. And my mom would always cut hers up and fry it a little bit, so it was so delicious in the soup. And that represents one of the most important things, which is wishing you health for the year. So we called this our good luck soup, and we invited... Oh, and I almost forgot. My mom had one other element 
that I couldn't find in any recipes. She would put a little piece of lemon rind in the soup in everybody's bowl. And it was just this freshness and brightness. And so when people would ask what that represented, I said, it's a wish from my mom for happiness and joy in the new year. We shared the soup with Tim's family, and it was a beautiful day in Arizona, like it so often is in January. And so we opened our front doors, and we sat on the front porch, and neighbors were walking by. And we invited neighbors in to share in some of our good luck soup and to share in the other foods I had made. I had made chicken and sushi and other kinds of things. Um, and so they came in, and Tim's family has a tradition of making seven and sevens, and so he had some alcohol in hand, so we invited them in to drink a little too, which always makes a party. So we called some friends, and they stopped by, and the party continued until Tim's family actually left. They flew out, and we still had friends and family hanging out. We had such a good time that first year that we decided maybe we'd do it a little bit more formally the next year. And so we printed out flyers, and we invited people, our neighbors and friends. And we opened our house on that New Year's Day in 2010 at noon. And people didn't leave until like 11 o'clock at night. It was such a wonderful time to gather and tell everybody about our soup. Over the years, we've continued that tradition. And it be, has become an event where it's an informal reunion for like our daughters who graduated from high school and they could have their friends stop by then. Or if I haven't seen a friend all year, I'll be sure to invite them to our New Year's Day open house so I can at least see them to start the new year. I haven't been able to continue all the traditions. I don't regularly get the trash out of the house and I definitely spend money on New Year's Day. Um, but if you ask my daughters now, they will say, we do have a family tradition that's all their own. And fingers crossed, we'll be able to continue that tradition January 1st, 2022. And if we do, you're all invited. Thank you so much. Wow, such an amazing story, Kathy. Thank you very much for that. Thanks. So what went into the crafting of that story? Oh, well, you know, when I saw the prompt, it's a tradition, I immediately thought of my daughters asking um, me what traditions they had, and their kind of disappointment that we didn't have some regular family traditions, but they did say, but the one family tradition we have is our New Year's Day open house, so it was nice to be able to tell the story about how we got there. It was sort of unexpected, and it's... Um, Sad that we ha aren't able to have it like in the last year, but we're really hoping we can have it again in awesome. the next year. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, uh, audience, we're going to move forward now. Uh, we're able to go a little more in depth into the conversation with our guests tonight. So we'll move on to the discussion and the Q&A part of the show. We'll start with a few questions from ASU Care for everyone to answer here. If you have any questions for one particular storyteller, or for all of us, please drop those questions in the comments whenever you're, wherever you're watching. This is your opportunity to steer the chat with our guests and get to know our storytellers. Please share your thoughts. All right. Well, we see all the kudos for all the cooking in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, so we do have a few questions we can ask our, our tellers tonight, but if you have any questions at home, please uh, go ahead and just hit that keyboard, hit the send button, and uh, put some comments in there. So uh, what was it like crafting your story? Um, wait, hang on. We'll move on to the next one. Sorry. <laughs> I've asked that before. Okay. Uh, this question for Carly and for Kathy. Uh, what can you tell us about your storytelling background and experience? Oh, let Carly go first. Oh, sure. Thank you, Kyle. So um, I started as a fan, and I'll say I still am a fan. Um, I started as an audience member of the Storytellers Project, um, and within a few years, I was telling stories on that stage, and then I was coaching other storytellers. And so I really loved that perspective of helping people um, uh, make meaning out of their memories and sharing that with, with their neighbors. Um, that's been so rewarding. So it's fun to also be on this side of the microphone again for a minute and tell a story. So, Kathy? And so that one experience of wearing that, um, I 
up to Camp Smith Megan, and then I was led, later met with Warren, and so they encouraged me to tell that story and a little bit of an expanded story, and I, I did so. And then after that, it's really been through support from other friends to tell stories, and I met, I took a class at South Mountain Community College, storytelling and student, met some wonderful people, and actually designed and produced a storytelling show with Mario Avent, who told here last month, called A Slice, um, it was stories and cake that we did at Space 55 Theater. Oh, amazing. Let's see, for myself, how did I get into storytelling? Uh, well, I actually took a class at South Mountain Community College, and I needed an elective, and I was looking around the catalog. This is back in the day, so you weren't searching on the web, you were looking at an actual catalog. So I opened that catalog, and I looked, and I saw uh, mythology. And I said, you know what, I like Hercules. I've seen Disney Hercules a few times. I'm going to jump into it. And so I took the class, and it was with the Liz Warren, who is the director of our Storytelling Institute at South Mountain. And it was just a phenomenal class. And when she introduced storytelling to me, that just kind of clicked. You know, a little light bulb went off, and that just got bit by the bug. And I went on to take more classes, and here I am today now teaching for us. And it's uh, been amazing. So uh, the next question we'll move on to is, how did you keep storytelling alive in your life in 2020 and in 2021? Do you want to go oh. first this time? Yep. Go ahead, Kathy. OK. I, you know, I was invited to do one virtual storytelling um, with the Storytelling Project. And so that was a fun thing to take part in. Um, I participated in some events where we were encouraging others to tell their stories around issues regarding the election and health issues. And so that's probably the main way. And then just with our family around dinner time, that's where probably most of the storytelling was kept alive. Absolutely. I love that we keep coming back to food. I feel like that we can expand on that. Um, I. I remember really consciously working with um, in our family around as the pandemic was kind of closing us into our house, I was working on graduate work around storytelling. And so I was really geeking out at that moment. And I, my husband and I talked this through and kind of made a pivot where we would say things out loud at dinner on purpose that were maybe helpful somehow of showing our kids resilience or, you know, like a, a time that we had a disagreement with a colleague, but how we turned it around or, you know, how we deal with disappointment. Um, I remember, this is super nerdy, but I, I do remember trying to do that on purpose and out loud just in my little family as a coping mechanism to get through COVID um, and also really consciously trying to feed that energy and knowledge into our kids to try to help them be resilient for whatever was, was going to come. So I, I love that line. I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt, but she said, we, we can't change the world for our kids, but we can prepare our kids for the world. And I, I really um, kind of took that on this last year and a half because my kids are little, so we've got a long ways to go. <laughs> Wow. Well, that's great. Great, great. So myself, uh, for 2020, let's see. Well, first, it was initial shock that hit everybody, right? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And then after that, um, we really started thinking and having a dialogue, I guess, within my family and in my, you know, indigenous community, right? And talking about resiliency and talking about, you know, overcoming what's ahead, right? And how we do that is we pull from the past, you know, we look behind us, we listen to the stories, we sing songs, we say prayers, and that's what really kind of projected us forward. And so for myself, um, I really just became proactive with doing more online storytelling events through um, Storytellers USA, um, just a few things we had at the college, and then just within the community in general, just kind of just giving people that, that perspective, you know, that, that resiliency, like Carly said, you know, looking at where we've came, you know, as a people and where we're going next, you know, and just kind of reminding everybody that and uh, just showing the light at the end of the tunnel. All right. So another question we have is, let's see. All right. Um, okay. So May Ann, uh, she has a question for us. It says, I have a hard time thinking anyone would care about a story of mine. Did any of you ever have to get over that hump before storytelling for a crowd? 
<laughs> I will say yes, definitely. <laughs> but you know, it's so nice to hear everybody's story. I think hearing just people's small stories, really you can connect to them. And so I know that I enjoy hearing about people's lives, um, however intricate they are, and even if they're different or the same, that's what the connection is all about. And so that's what I love about storytelling. You know, Kyle Absolutely. and Carly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think too, I, the first part of your question where you thought people don't want to hear your story, that's just not true at all. And um, I know, you know, we run into that if we try to maybe talk to your family members. If you sit down your grandmother and say, tell me your story, she'll say, I'm not interesting. But, but uh, we all do want to hear all those. And um, it's funny, it's, it's in the specifics that we actually can tap into the universal, which sounds backwards. But like Kathy's story about the mochi, like, I've definitely never made that, but you know, we have very specific cooking rituals in my family. So finding those little moments of connection um, where the specifics are different, but the heart is there, the intention and the message and the story is there. So um, get out of your own way and, and don't imagine that people don't want to hear your story because they do. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, everybody has a story to share. Every story, you know, uh, brings awareness, brings meaning. Um, usually when I prepare, I always kind of remind myself, you know, that, that my words in the story are like a paintbrush, right? And everybody in the audience is a blank slate. So it's my job as a storyteller to convey those images, those different things. And once I start sharing the story, I myself am no longer scared because it's no longer about me. It's about the story that we're living together. And so now we have one more question from Tim. Uh, why are stories so important to you and your communities? And why do you think they're so powerful? You want to start with that one, Kyle? Uh-oh. Yeah, you okay. go first. <laughs> Let's see. So within my, my background, you know, stories are basically the foundation for our culture. You know, they, they really kind of give us insight to our identity. You know, and as I used for an example earlier, right, we tap into that for resiliency. And I think the power with that is that correlation and that direct connection to identity, right? So if I tell Dene, if I tell Navajo stories, that speaks to me directly, right? That speaks to me to my core because those were passed down for generation and generation. And so they found their way to me. And if I can share that to the next generation or to other audiences, we're all the better for that. So Carly, Kathy, whoever wants to go. Oh, what, you want to? I can't improve on that, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do think it's important, the, the memories part of it. So I do remember thinking of myself as kind of a, along with May's question that I felt like an ambivalent storyteller. I wasn't sure you know, what part of my story people might be connected to, but then part of it's keeping different pieces of your background and how other people have lived alive too. So I like that part of the power of storytelling. So when I talk about the Japanese flower farms down on Baseline Road, there are so many people who remember them, and then there are a lot of people who didn't know about them at all. And so I like telling stories about that for something that's new to people, but also evokes this sense of, oh yeah, that's what Phoenix used to be like. So those things make it very powerful for me. Awesome, thank you, thank you. So we have a, a question from the audience. Do we have any favorite stories, storytellers, books, or films that we can share with you? So, Carly, do you have any favorite books, stories that you can recommend to our audience? Oh, my goodness. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't suggest they listen to the I'm Telling podcast, which is out of <laughs> the Storytelling Institute at South Mountain. That is um, faculty and students um, producing stories. Um, I, I, I am a big believer that uh, in listening to stories that you become a better teller, just like um, painters would copy the old masters or, you know, you have to look at really good ones to, to, to crack the code. So um, definitely, um, but for me, all of them are stories. You know, I listen to uh, public radio or, or a movie or, you know, any of these contemporary things, and those are all stories all through thread throughout it. So once you start cracking that code, you'll see them everywhere. Nice. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I, I do listen to the moth, especially when I'm driving places, and I love some of those stories and hearing them. Um, and there are some comedians that their format of telling comedy is actually in storytelling. So I think about Hassan Minaj, who's terrific, the um, Homecoming King, such a great example of how he tells this, his own story and he weaves in all these other aspects to it. Um, so that's one of my favorites also. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Let's see. Uh, so again, you know, I'd say just to echo Carly, you know, that I'm Telling is a great podcast because that really shows what our students are doing within the classroom and storytelling. So it gives you that insight, you know, from that initial entry level. Uh, beyond that, I would say anything about storytelling, you just have to experience it. At the end of the day, you just have to be here because storytelling is three elements, right? It's the teller, the story, and the audience. And that's really what makes a successful event. So if you're able to attend anything virtually, you know, the Arizona Storytellers or Storytellers USA is a great one to go to. You can YouTube it. They have a lot of past tellers, including both of these individuals I'm with today. <laughs> Um, and then in addition, once you know, we open back up and we start having events, we love to have you on campus or just anywhere in the valley just to bring this life back, um, livelihood. So thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, one more question. Uh, when was the last time you told a story in front of a full venue audience? Oh my gosh. Dun, dun, dun. All right. That's a good question. Thank it you. <laughs> um. I'm sure, I'm thinking it was in 20, it was definitely in 2019, early in the year though, because everything, um, yeah, so, but I don't remember. <laughs> this is the first time I've been with people telling, other people besides my family. Right. Oh, telling a story. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. It has been a while. <laughs> I think I've told a few stories. Well, I got to tell a story in April to a college class, and that was the first time I'd been with people, and the first time I had to tell a story with a mask on. So we're all learning, but I know that we're all excited to be able to gather again in person. So it has been a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Just again, you know, I think the last time we had a full venue show was back in 2019. I cannot remember because I feel like 2020, I lived five lifetimes within that time. <laughs> so yeah, it's been quite some time. All right, one more question for uh, our tellers. Do you have any recommendations for people interested in getting good or better at storytelling? I would honestly recommend the Storytelling Institute. It, they have all sorts of classes. They have drop-in classes just in on the, or they used to, I don't know if mm -hmm. they currently yeah. do, yep. the weekend. Um, and everybody there is so supportive. There's also, if we open back up, there are some open mic places. And I would have said at our venue at Space 55 Theater, we would welcome people who were new to storytelling to come up and tell a story with us. So I think those are really good opportunities. We often had a very small audience, so it was uh, not overwhelming to do so. But definitely the Storytelling Institute's the way to go. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Carly? I, absolutely, mm -hmm. and there, um, I'm thinking of um, um, Storyline with Dan, oh, right? Yes. That was at Changing Hands in the Before mm -hmm. Times. Um, but there's so many, I know uh, somebody asked us for specifics and I kind of punted. So I know there's a lot of storytelling podcasts. Kathy mentioned The Moth. Um, um, I like that one as well. But I think the more you listen to them, that is a great way to get better. It's just training your ear to what are the elements that make it successful. So the more you can listen to stories, the better too. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And again, I gotta echo uh, my fellow tellers. <laughs> uh, you know, we do a lot of good programming at South Mountain. Uh, we do have a structure, you know, we do have, you know, just different things to help you as a teller. Um, I know when I first got into storytelling, I was looking and I was watching people on the stage and I was thinking, I could never do that. I could never do that. Be that precise, be that clean, right? Mm -hmm. It was, it was a lot. But then taking a class and understanding how to break down stories and understanding that there's all different types of stories. There's not just personal, there's folk tales, there's fairy tales, there's myth, there's legends, there's creation, there's just everything from A to Z. And so, yeah, come on down, check us out at South Mountain. Uh, we do have workshops, I think, starting back up probably in the spring, and you're more than welcome to come down. In the meantime, yeah, just jump on YouTube, do what you can from home, and learn what you can. We look forward to seeing you soon at South. All right, Tracy, I'm getting to your question now. 
I love how all of you had many traditions involving food. What about clothing? Some families wear their pajamas all day, even out on public on Christmas Day, for example. <laughs> mm. Throw that mm. to... <laughs> Um, we tried to have a, a t-shirt tradition on Christmas Day where we each had our own t-shirts that we would wear every year. <laughs> um, but yet when I was young, we definitely did. We, we always had new pajamas that we would wear. Oh, and I guess the other tradition is we always get underwear in the stockings for the girls. <laughs> so that's kind of a clothing tradition. <laughs> that's I don't right. know. Yeah, clothes can be a lot of fun for that, for sure. We have the Christmas pajamas. Um, and then we go one further, and if you get socks or underwear as a Christmas present, we sign it as from the dog, <laughs> because we know that that's kind of a crummy gift. So that's how we get around that. But um, I know there are some storytelling events around um, clothing and costume and garments, um, and so that, that is a really rich area. I think Kathy and I just landed on food today. <laughs> yeah. As for me, um, I'm pretty plain. I don't know. I don't really get dressed up in pajamas. <laughs> I don't do it just on the holidays. It kind of happens on the weekend thing. Stroll it out, pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have one more question. Uh, who are some good local storytellers you can mention so our viewers know who they should see live or learn more about? Carly, you probably work with some good storytellers, right? At the sure, mm -hmm. well, a storytellers project um, has, uh, um, but that's 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 national for sure. I know we've mentioned Liz Warren is the is the faculty. Um, she's the founder of the Storytelling Institute. Um, so there's, um, I would put her on the list. I I I'm sorry, I'm actually not super on social media, so I couldn't say like who to follow or like kind of that angle, but did you oh. want to speak to that? Yeah. Or Kathy? Yeah. Oh, well, I would definitely mention Liz because she's oh. fantastic and she is so supportive um, and has a blog about storytelling that um, students in her class also tell stories on that. So she's someone. There are some other local storytellers. It is hard because we've not seen anyone for so long. <laughs> yeah. um, that, well, and a lot of the people who have told here on Gather, I think, are also people to follow. So I know Mario from last year, Sean, or from last month, and Chantel before that. They're, they're good storytellers to follow, too. Um, Travis May is another storyteller. Uh, Marilyn Torres, mm -hmm. terrific storyteller. So there's a lot of good storytellers. Actually, the Valley is, has so many good people and so many supportive. It's a, it's a wonderful community to be part of. Yeah, definitely. You know, two, two locals I could think of that really thrive and try to grow the storytelling within the valley would be uh, Dan Hull, mm -hmm. right? Changing hands. Mm -hmm. uh, does phenomenal programming. And he actually has an open mic, or used to have an open mic pre-pandemic. So, storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, storyline. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could look up storyline um, in Phoenix, you'll be able to get his information. Another one is uh, uh, Steve Badal. I can't remember. Mm. I can't get his last name. Mm -hmm. uh, Buvala, I think it is. Steve Buvala. And he is a, he's a master teller. He's located out in the West Valley. Um, I will make sure I get his information and share it with everybody here. But he's a phenomenal teller as well as a master trainer for, for the storytelling arts. Uh, but those are the individuals I would recommend. Other than that, yeah, just pretty much whoever you see, that's a normal. I mean, a, <laughs> a regular. Pretty much that's how it goes for us. We'll tell and then we'll keep going and keep going. You know, I really have appreciated with, I mean, we've talked a lot about like, or I, my story was about, you know, things we had to change or pivot or let go of. But one of the things I've really enjoyed was actually this proliferation of virtual events because it's like a lower threshold. You don't have to think about if you really want to buy a ticket or if you really want to go deal with parking, you can pop in. And so I just think, I hope some element of that continues even when it's safe to be together again. And I hope that our listeners will take advantage because it's really low threshold to just be able to pop into a story or maybe it's a topic or maybe it's an audience you might have not felt comfortable about in person, but you can do it now because you're home and they can't see you. So um, I just really would say take advantage of these virtual events because um, that's a great access that you couldn't have gotten 
otherwise. Oh, could I mention right. two other people? I was going to say Joy oh, yes. Young. Yes. Great. You Joy is terrific. And she does classes and I think is virtual. And then Kim Porter is a wonderful storyteller and also does virtual classes. And so I agree, the mm -hmm. virtual aspect has made it much more accessible in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Oh, Sean Buvala. That's who I'm thinking of, Sean Buvala. Okay. Yes, and he's out. Um, but yeah, you can look him up. He's a phenomenal teller. Oh, yeah. And Rachel Igboro. Yes, the there yes. you go. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Shout out to you helping out. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So if you could just tell a little bit about somebody who's interested in getting a storytelling, what, would you, what advice would you give them in just a few sentences? I think, um, I think part of the fun of working on personal stories is the memory work. So, um, and the best shortcut on that is to think about places. So if you think your stories aren't interesting or if you think you don't have any, sit down and think about the first house you grew up in, what that first bedroom looked like, your first teacher, that classroom. Um, those places are good memory triggers and just start jotting them down. Um, and then give in to that memory work because you don't know where you might end up and you really do have a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. And I would go along with that um, uh, first kinds of things. So in our um, Women's Health Project, one of the things we sometimes ask is, what was your first memory of hearing about sex? Or what was your first, when did you first get your period? What happened there? And those firsts often explode in details and memories and things that happened. So that's a, another good way to just use everyday things that happen, but the first time it happened to you. All right. Thank you both. <laughs> thank you both. Yeah. All right. So we're going to close out the show now. Uh, so thanks so much for circling up with us for Gather this month and chatting with our fascinating Arizona storytellers. Uh, it's been a great time sharing my story with you all and being tonight's host. Thank you very much. Uh, we have so much gratitude for Carly Davis and Kathy Niagua, and thank you, thank you all at home for being an excellent, phenomenal audience tonight and supporting Gather and all of our storytellers tonight. Thank you very much, and we wish you a good night. The theme is work it out. Watch just as you've done this evening on ASU Cares uh, YouTube, Facebook Live, or Twitch. We recommend that you subscribe to ASU Care YouTube channel right now so you won't miss any of the venues, musical, and storytelling streams. ASU Care is a self-sustaining venue that has been presenting live-streamed arts programming since April of last year. The venue made it to this point focused on creating paid performance opportunities for Arizona musicians and storytellers and to help keep the transformative power of the arts alive for our audiences. ASU Care gives or receives no funds from the university or the state and like so many other facilities has zero income for 15 plus months. They need your help to bounce back. If you have the means to do so, we would be honored if you stop by asu.care.com on your way off your device tonight and click on the gold Give Now button on top of the page to donate to ASU Care. You will be helping sustain artists and arts in a vital historical venue and ensuring that it can connect communities with beauty of the arts for decades to come. Thanks again for tuning in and good night.